This is episode 15 of Talking With, Brian Lamb's conversation with historian Richard Norton Smith. It starts after this. Which president had the best staff? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a good question. I, um, you're laughing because I'm, I'm saying this because it, it's so counter to, to uh, conventional thinking. Um, you know, Richard Nixon had a really good White House staff. I mean, there were some really bad people on it, but there were also some, some really very, very skillful um, people. Um, you look at his domestic... One, one of the elements of revisionism uh, is, is looking at Nixon's domestic record, which is, first of all, much more um, complete than, than people think of Nixon as a foreign policy president who didn't care about domestic policy, and uh, I think the truth is uh, is very different. I would say Eisenhower had an excellent staff. Um, of course, you're talking about it's apples and oranges because as late as the Hoover administration, you know, the staff was half a dozen people. Staff in the modern sense it doesn't even really begin with. I mean, FDR had more, but again, it was a it's a, a fragment compared to to the modern White House. I mean, when Gerald Ford um, became president, there were over five hundred people who were on the White House staff, and they may have been that may have been the last administration that made a deliberate effort to downsize the White House staff. And of course, what they found was they needed all those people. Who, in your opinion, was the best speaker? By the way, I also it's only fair to say Reagan had excellent staff. Reagan, um, Kim Baker, and, you know, chiefs of staff. I mean, it's it's tough to 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 top Baker. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. You were who's the best speaker in history? Uh, the president. Well, again, the, the the thing you need to keep in mind is. For most of our history, speaking was something you read in the newspaper the next day. So it's a question of if you mean speaking, for example, Jefferson's words are immortal, and we quote them, but Jefferson himself was a terrible, by all accounts, a terrible public speaker whose voice did not carry beyond the second row. In fact, the reason we didn't have a State of the Union address for 100 years Washington and Adams both delivered the annual address in person, even though Washington didn't like public speaking. It stopped with Jefferson, ostensibly because he thought it was too, it smacked of royalist trappings. But there's a school of thought that it's really because Jefferson was a very um, inadequate public speaker. And it was Woodrow Wilson who was a natural platform orator. Uh, and a great student of British parliamentary politics. He, Gladstone was his hero. Uh, I think Wilson was, was, without a doubt, one of the best public speakers. If you want to read uh, a, a brilliant speech, the, the best presidential speech since the Gettysburg Address, or the second inaugural of Lincoln, is Wilson's speech uh, asking Congress for declaration of war in April uh, 1917. It's, uh, it's, it's just gorgeous. His inaugural address is also among the Richard Nixon, when he was elected, uh, uh, sat down and read every presidential inaugural address. And he was particularly taken, I mean, some of them we know, the Roosevelt. Roosevelt's first and second inaugural address, obviously the Kennedy inaugural address. Um, but Wilson's was the one that really jumped off the page at him. When you look, and you've been talking history and presidential history all your life, uh, what are the myths that exist, in your opinion, about presidents that you would knock down if you ever wrote a book about them? I, I guess I would approach that. I remember American Heritage used to do um, a feature on the on the most overrated and underrated presidents. 
Um, and that, too, is, is going to be, in some ways, um, seasonal. It's going to reflect changing attitudes and tastes. I mean, for most of the 20th century, the Roosevelt model, TR and FDR, was seen as, you know, that's what, that's what a successful president was. You know, presidents occupying the bully pulpit, determining the national agenda, um, overawing Congress, uh, monopolizing the media, um, lending their name to an age. You know, great swashbuckling figures. And then along came Fred Greenstein at Princeton writing about the hidden hand leadership of Dwight Eisenhower, which was the opposite of the theatrical um, stage center president of, of, of an author, Schlesinger, for example. And then came Ronald Reagan, who combined some elements of both, who clearly had the theatrical um, centralism, if you will, uh, of, of, of the Roosevelts, uh, who had an agenda, who had um, unique communications abilities, the abilities to, to persuade, which Harry Truman said is the main job of the modern presidency. But for, for a small government decentralized reversal of the New Deal in a very real sense. So, so anyway, I, the reason I mention all that is there are, there are multiple schools of, of thought about what makes for a successful president. And at times, they, they morph into stereotypes and caricatures. Um, how do you measure Lyndon Johnson? Um, hugely important in the history of civil rights. A president, maybe a uniquely, certainly more than FDR, uh, who insisted the American people had the wealth and the moral obligation to care about the poor in their midst. I mean, a president who was willing in some ways to shame us, um, and yet a president who frittered away his moral authority by the way he wasn't honest with us about Vietnam. I mean, how do you, you know, how do you label a president like that? Um, and how long does it take before you can put all of that duality, complexity, contradictions into some kind of historical perspective? What do you measure that against? Um... Johnson lent himself to stereotype. Johnson suffered, I think, because he thought he was being stereotyped, condescended to, as you know, the, the Southern corn pone figure. Um, Johnson's insecurities, um, which are not a stereotype, which I think in some ways our one key toward understanding him and yet they existed with very real ideals real idealism um, I mean all you can say is he's a Shakespearean figure not many American presidents rise to that to that level and I mean rise to that level in terms of significance complexity um the difficulty they present in um, defining them, in knowing them, in even understanding, you know, their priorities. Which president do you most enjoy being asked to talk about or write about? Well, that's a good question. Um, Coolidge is great fun for many reasons. First of all, because he is so much more than the stereotype. Coolidge fostered the stereotype, Silent Cal, you know, the pinch penny Vermonter, which if you stop to think about it, was politically very shrewd in the 1920s, a period of excess, a period of uh, financial and other excess. Coolidge 
was the countervailing. You know, millions of people who had no intention of living in a farmhouse without electricity or running water felt vicariously virtuous because they had a president who did. Um, and that then leads to, it's the mystery. It's the unsolved elements of these stories. I mean, every president has things about him that, um, you know, we, we don't really know enough about. Everyone has easy sort of stereotypical components. I mean, it's, it's, it's getting behind the one and knowing the other. Um, Washington is, um, is an inexhaustible resource in that sense. Washington is so many stereotypes. Uh, they began when he was still alive. We needed a mythical Washington. Uh, we embalmed him while he was still alive because we had nothing. The Constitution was a scrap of parchment. We had nothing to bond us except the kind of heroic example of Washington. The problem with that was we, we went too far and we turned him into a deity, a demigod, and we robbed him. We robbed his life of the drama, of growth, of evolution, of, um, of from this callow young man who wanted very conventional forms of success to this genuinely heroic, self-sacrificing figure who literally, you know, measured up to the to the figure on 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 horseback. Um, every president, to varying degrees, goes through that process. It seems to me. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, I have such mixed feelings. Um, there's part of me that just wants to join the crowd and enjoy T.R. Um, when he died, a, a policeman said to his sister, he said, oh, I think her name was Corinne Robinson. Said, oh, Mrs. Robinson, it was the fun of him, you know, the fun of being led by him. I mean, not many presidents inspire that kind of reaction. There are presidents we admire. Um, there are presidents we look up to. But there are very few presidents who engender a sense of joy in our remembrance. And that's why I think T.R. is the most vivid of our presidents. A hundred years later, we're still selling Maxwell House coffee with... Uh, his line about good to the last drop. I mean, he's still... The, and what I mean, of course, is it's it's the, uh, you know, what remains, what's vivid is the surface. You know, the caricature. Um, it's it's the it's figure from Arsenic and Old Lace charging up the stairs, you know, imagining he's Teddy Roosevelt. The slightly mad, you know... Um, it's the colorful, it's the entertaining. Uh, it's the man who gave us the teddy bear. I mean, you know, thank God for Edmund Morris, who rescued the real TR, the subtle, sometimes melancholy, um, very shrewd, rather self-absorbed um, figure in those three brilliant volumes. I mean, if you want a model presidential biography, there it is. If you were to write a book about presidents, knowing what as you a group, know... As opposed to individually. Yeah, <clears throat> about the presidency, um, how would you approach it, given what we've talked about, the, the audience in mind, your own career in mind? What, how would you make it different? Well, I mean, I wouldn't think much about my own career. I think what I would... Um, the, the, first of all, you have to take... You have to be cognizant of, of, of realities. If you want to reach... If you want to be commercially published. So then the question becomes, okay, what I'm writing has to have some relevance it has to speak to a contemporary audience. 
Um, you have to find a formula, a structure, a theme. Um, what would be your theme? What would be your theme? It depends on when you write it. If I were writing it now, I think it would be a reminder that it isn't your grandfather's presidency anymore. That generations were brought up to believe that what I call the Arthur Schlesinger model of the presidency, the Roosevelt model of the presidency. The father or the son? Um, but TR and FDR, both. Well, I was thinking about but, Arthur Schlesinger Sr. Oh, I'm sorry, or Arthur Jr. Schlesinger Jr. Jr. Yeah. Um, who um, conducted several surveys of historians, which in turn kind of shaped the criteria. Um, I mean, all you need to know is that in the first survey after he left the White House, the Schlesinger survey, Eisenhower ranked below Chester Arthur. He was, I think, number 22 at a time when there were a lot fewer presidents than there are now. Okay. In the most recent C-SPAN survey, Eisenhower ranked fifth. Now, I'm not, it's not to say one is right and one is wrong, but there's a, a discernible trend there. And, you know, in the larger sense, why? Why is Eisenhower ranked as high as he is? Well, that then leads to the fact that there are alternatives to the Arthur Schwarzenegger model of presidential success. It's, it's a mistake, I think, to say one is liberal and one is conservative, but broadly speaking, one is activist and, and, and president-centric and Washington-centric, and the other, for lack of a better uh, word, might be thought to be more Jeffersonian, uh, more limited uh, in its approach to government, more decentralized. In other words, the New Deal and the centralization of authority in Washington and particularly in the executive is reversible. And, you know, you could argue that much of the last 50 years is an attempt to do to do just that. So that that sense that the um, that there are multiple ways of defining presidential success, again, depending upon the particular challenges and the culture in which a president is operating. The, one thing that we we tend to exaggerate the the, the degree to which we start over every January 20th, you know, four years or eight years. I mean, I would argue that our presidential history is much more about continuities than we assume. And consequently, if you're looking for yardsticks to, to measure presidential performance, for example, how many presidents over the last 60 years have grappled with the seemingly insoluble problems in the Middle East? Some have been more successful than others, but they've they've operated in different situations and different circumstances with with different cards to play. Um, so there's one, for example, yardstick that you you know that you could measure across a, a, a long period of time. I mean, traditionally, there are, you know how a president deals with Congress. Uh, how he uh, uses the media, uh, you know, how persuasive uh, he is. Um, you know, uh, there's a whole host of fairly conventional, ongoing measurements. When you speak to audiences about the presidency, though, what do they want? What, where do they... Oh, they invariably, they want... <laughs> what do you think of the current president? Or, yeah, but before... or the recent... They, 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 they want, to, you know... You may, where will about... Barack Obama finish in the history books? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you can carry that forward. But I mean, people have a, and it's perfectly understandable, um, and you try to explain all the reasons why you need time, particularly, particularly polarizing presidents. You need time for the passions 
to cool. You need time for the papers to become available. You need time to measure how their successors deal with some of the same issues that they dealt with. I mean, it's, it's one reason why, I mean, I think we're too close to Bill Clinton to pass judgment. Um, if Hillary Clinton had been elected, would that have, I mean, arguably it would have made a significant difference in Bill Clinton's historical standing. Why? Because it suggests that his hold over the Democratic Party, his basically centrist approach, slightly left of center, but, you know, Southern Democratic governor um, was not limited to the 1990s and to his presidency. Uh, you know, uh, George W. Bush stubbed his toe badly on immigration and privatizing Social Security. 20 years from now, is it not possible that he will be vindicated on, on both? That's why it's a dangerous game to play. And, and, and it's also why, if you're going to play the game, you've got to be willing to go back, in effect, to the jury every few years, or certainly every couple presidencies, uh, simply because... It is such a fluid, evolving, in some ways unpredictable exercise. Richard Norton Smith is an American historian and author. You can listen to more interviews with him by searching his name in the video library at cspan.org.